Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, wa kafa, wa salat, wa salamu ala, man la nabiyya ba'da, wa ba'd. Alhamdulillah, we are finishing off the last of Ayah 64, and the other pages that we are beginning with, from Ayah 65 and onward. Imam al Jawzi rahimahullah, he has said, quote, and so the Exalted One has mentioned in this regard, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ يَدُ اللَّهِ مَغْلُولَةٌ غُلَّتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَلُعِنُوا بِمَا قَالُوا بَلْ يَدَاهُ مَبْسُوطَتَانِ يُنْفِقُ كَيْفَ يَشَاءُ وَلَيَزِيدَنَّ كَثِيرًا مِّنْهُمْ مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ تُغْيَانًا وَكُفْرًا وَأَلْقَيْنَا بَيْنَهُمُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَاءَ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ كلما أوقدوا نارا للحرب أتفأها الله ويسعون في الأرض فسادا والله لا يحب المح والله لا يحب المفسدين ولو أن أهل الكتاب آمنوا واتقوا لكفرنا عنهم سيئاتهم ولأدخلناهم جنات النعيم ولو أنهم أقاموا التوراة والإنجيل وما أنزل إليهم من ربهم لأكلوا من فوقهم ومن تحت أرجلهم منهم أمة مقتصدا وكثير منهم ساء ما يعملون يا أيها الرسول بلغ ما أنزل إليك من ربك وإن لم تفعل فما بلغت رسالته والله يعصمك من الناس إن الله لا يهدي القوم الكافرين قل يا أهل الكتاب لستم على شيء حتى تقيم التوراة والإنجيل وما أنزل إليكم من ربكم ولا يزيدن كثيرا منهم ما أنزل إليك من ربك طغيانا وكفرا فلا تأس على القوم الكافرين إن الذين آمنوا والذين هادوا والصابئين إن الذين آمنوا والذين هادوا والصابئون والنصارى من آمن بالله واليوم الآخر وعمل صالحا فلا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون لقد أخذنا ميثاق بني إسرائيل وأرسلنا إليهم رسلا كلما جاءهم رسول بما لا تهوى أنفسهم فريقا كذبوا وفريقا يقتلون <تصفيق> And so the Jews say, the hand of Allah is tied up. But may they be cursed and may their hands be tied up for the blasphemy that they have said. On the contrary, indeed both of his hands are outspread and he spins how he wills. And that which has been sent down to you from your Lord only causes them to increase in wickedness and unrighteousness towards their Lord and unbelief and wrongdoing. We have put among them enmity and hatred that will endure until the day of resurrection where they shall be gathered. 
Whenever they should kindle the flames of war, Allah puts it out. And they strive to spread corruption in the land. And Allah does not love those who are the corruptors. And if the people of the book had believed and kept to their commandments and their covenant, then we would have removed their sins, expiated from them that, and, give, and made them to enter the gardens of paradise. And had they established and, and held and stuck fast to the Torah, the Injil, and that which had been sent down to them from their Lord, then their sustenance would have been increased, and they would have received great plenty from above and from beneath their feet. There was also a group among them keeping to the balanced way, but many of them, most evil is that which they were doing from the past. Messenger, convey and confirm to the people that which has been sent down to you from your Lord and convey it. If you do not convey it, then you have not fully communicated and given the message. And Allah will protect you from the corruption of the people. Indeed, Allah does not guide an unbelieving people. And indeed, those who believe and then those who were Jews and those who were Sabians and those who were Christians, whoever should believe in Allah in the last day and does righteous deeds shall have nothing to fear nor shall they grieve. We took a covenant from the children of Israel that we sent to them messengers. Whenever a messenger came to them with a command that their souls disliked and that their desires did not incline to, then a group of them they denied, and then a group of them they killed. Surah Al-Ma'idah, the fifth surah, ayat 64 to 70. And so, Allah has said that he puts out the flames of war. And this is referring to the Jews and their seeking to commit warfare against the Muslims. And that whenever they gather to make war against the Prophet wasallam, Allah scattered their ranks and lowered their rank. So when they planned, Allah rejected their plan and laid it to waste. And they spread corruption in the earth. This is referring to four things that they spread. One is sinful deeds and all types of disobedience. As mentioned by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. The secondly is that the corruption that they spread was trying to erase the mentioning of Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, from their books, rejecting Islam and the things to do with the signs of Islam. And this is mentioned by Az Zajjaj. Thirdly, is that they were engaged in kufr. And fourthly, is that they were engaged in oppression. And this was discussed by Imam al-Marwirdi. Now Allah says, if the people of the book had, 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 if the people of the book had established, had believed, and had fear of Allah, then we would have expiated from them their sins. Now if the people of the book had believed, this is referring to the Jews and the Christians, that they believed in Allah and His messengers and had fear, meaning of shirk, we would have expiated from them their sins, meaning that we would have forgiven that which, would, that, would, that which came before. And if they had established the Torah and the Injil, Ibn Abbas says, meaning that if they had acted by what was in these two books and in what was sent to them from their Lord. So if they'd acted by the books of all the prophets that came before, and number two, if they'd accepted what came after, the Qur'an, because they were being addressed therein, and some of the ayat sent down solved the issues that they had. If they'd done all of this, then they would have ate from all of that which came before them and from under them. What that means is they would have had, number one, the best things to come from the sky of the produce that was germinated in the earth and the vegetation in the earth that would have come from that rain. And this is the statement of Ibn Abbas, Mujahid, and Qatada ibn Da'ima. Secondly, is that they would have received the great expanse of Allah's mercy and goodness. Now Allah, the exalted, knows that and has taught us that when someone has taqwa, this is a reason for Allah to increase their sustenance. The more taqwa has, the more taqwa someone has, the more Allah assists them in their sustenance. Just like when Allah says, if they had believed, 
ففتحنا عليهم بركات من السماء والأرض. And if they believe, we would have opened up for them the blessings of the sky and the earth. Surah Araf, the seventh surah, ninety six. And Allah says, ويرزقه من حيث لا يحتسب. And He will sustain them from where they never knew it was possible to be sustained from. Surah Al Talaq, ayah three. The exalted one has said that from them is an ummah that is well balanced. Meaning from the people of the book, there is an ummah from among them that is well balanced. That means that there are those among them that have become Muslim. And they are well balanced. And this was stated by Ibn Abbas and Mujahid. As for Imam Al-Qurdi, Imam Al-Qurdi has said, these people are none other than those who said that the Messiah is the slave of Allah and His Messenger. And when someone is well balanced, that means that they are balanced in their words and their deeds without exaggeration and without neglect. So they say neither too much or too little. And when the Exalted One says, Prophet, convey what was sent down to you from your Lord. Scholars of commentary say that this ayah was sent down for a number of reasons. It's related by Hassan that the Prophet ﷺ said, When Allah sent me and the message was given to me, I felt great worry and concern and I knew at that point, who the people were going to be that would that would disobey me and deny me. And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was very cautious of the Quraysh and the Christians and the Jews. So Allah sent this ayah. Mujahid also said that when this ayah was sent down, Messenger, convey what was sent down to you from your Lord. That he said, O oh my Lord, what shall I do? I'm alone and the people have gathered against me. How will I convey the message? So Allah sent down to him. If you do not convey the message, then you have not conveyed, conveyed his message. And Allah will protect you from the people. Muqatil mentioned that when the Jews called against him, and most of them moved against him, and they were mocking him, he stayed silent. And this ayah was sent down. Ibn Abbas said that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, when he was by himself he was under the constant threat of death but at times Abu Talib would help him and every day men would come from the Banu Hashim looking for him until this ayah was sent down and when this ayah was sent down he said indeed Allah has protected me from the jinn and the human beings. And this is collected by Ibn Marduway. Abu Huraira also mentioned that when this ayah was sent down one day, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was reclining under a tree, and his sword was attached to the tree. And a man came and took the sword, and he said, Muhammad, who will protect you from me now? And he said, Allah. And the sword dropped. He then picked up the sword. And now he had possessed it. And Allah sent the ayah. And Allah will protect you from the people. There is another incident as well. Where the messenger of Allah وسلم, recited this ayah. And it is one day. And it was one night. When there was a. And there was an incident, and Aisha as anha asked him, What is wrong? Why do you wait? And he said, I know that there is a righteous man who's going to come and try to protect me tonight. So when we were waiting in the night, I heard the sound of clinking armor. And it was just outside the door. And he said, Who is this? And the one with the armor answered, It is Sa'ad 
And another one said, it is Hudayfa. We have come to protect you. And so the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he slept until he heard the clinking of the armor. And then Allah sent down a revelation. And Allah will protect you from the people. At that point when this revelation came, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, had a dome that was on top of his house. And under that dome was his window when he stuck his head out of the window and he said, People, return back to your places. I need no further guarding at this point. Allah will preserve me. As for the statement, as for the statement, convey what has been sent down to you. As Zajaj has said, it means that convey all of what was sent down to you. Don't leave anything off. And don't leave anything from that which you've been revealed, that which has been revealed to you, out of fear of what may happen to you. If you had left anything of the revelation, then you would not have conveyed your message. Ibn Qutaybah has said, This ayah is proof that Allah was protecting him to make sure that he could convey his message. Ibn Abbas said, It is as if Allah is saying, If you conceal one ayah, then you have not conveyed my message. So it means that convey what was sent down to you out loud. And if you happen to conceal anything from it, out of fear of some harm that would come to you, it is as if you didn't convey anything. And his message is Tawheed. And Allah will protect you from the people. And this is the Isma of Allah. Now the Isma of Allah is two types. The first type of Isma means infallibility, where Allah protects his slave from all forms of disobedience. But the second form is when you talk about food, the food shall be covered and protected from going out of date. Or the food can't protect you when you're hungry, so eat it. So linguistically, this is what it means. Now, someone may ask, someone may ask, but wait a minute. On the Battle of Uhud, the molar teeth of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, were broken. And he suffered trial and tribulation because of this. What does this ayah mean when it says, and Allah will protect you from the people, when in fact he was injured in the Battle of Uhud? What does this mean when we look at this ayah? As for this ayah, and Allah will protect you from the people, Surah Al-Ma'idah, the fifth surah, ayah 67, there are two ways we can answer this question. One is that Allah never said that he would protect him from ever suffering harm from people. The protection was from all types of disobedience, but it was also protection from being murdered and taken prisoner. The protection from being murdered and being taken prisoner. But the ayah never promised a general protection from any harm whatsoever. You should also remember that this ayah was sent down after much of the harm and tribulation had come to him. Because Surah Al-Ma'idah was among the last surahs that was revealed. 
So this had already occurred. And when Allah says, and indeed he, Allah, will not guide an unbelieving people, there are two things this is making reference to. One is that he will not guide them to the paradise. And two, he will not make them to know the revelation that they have in their midst. When the Exalted One says, Say, people of the book, you are upon nothing. The reason for this being sent down is that the Jews had said to the Prophet ﷺ, don't you believe in what we have of the Torah? And you bear witness that it is true? He said, yes indeed. But you have corrupted and innovated things regarding what is in it. And I am free from that which you've corrupted. The Jews responded with, we are upon clear guidance. And we take a hold of that which we have with ourselves. We do not believe in you. And so this ayah was sent down as mentioned by Ibn Abbas. Now as far as the people of the book being addressed here, the people of the book being addressed is in reference to the Jews and the Christians. And when Allah says you're not upon anything, meaning you're not upon anything regarding the true faith until you establish the Torah and the Injil. And establishing both of them means the knowledge of what is in them. And in particular, that is in reference to belief in Muhammad sallallahu and in that which was sent down to them from their Lord. And in what was given to them from before. Then Allah says, those who believe and those who are Jews and those who are Sabians. We've already mentioned the discussion of this type of wording in Surah Al-Baqarah. And someone can return to the commentary on those for further details. Now, likewise, there's difference of opinion in the judgments and the abrogation mentioned in this ayah. And different people use different judgments to discuss the matter. But let's be clear that this ayah understands those who believe and those who are Jews. Whoever believes in Allah in the last day and does righteous deeds, there is no fear upon them, nor shall they grieve. And the same ruling stands for the Sabians and the Christians if they believe in Allah on the last day and do righteous deeds, then they will be forgiven. Not that them being Sabians and Jews and Christians is tacitly approved. Allah then said that we took the covenant of the children of Israel. Muqatil says that this means that he took their covenant in the Torah, but that they would act by what was in the Torah. Ibn Abbas said that when Allah says in the ayah that there's a group of prophets that they denied and a group of prophets that they killed. Now, among those who they denied were Muhammad and Isa alayhim as-salatu was But among those who they killed were Zakaria and Yahya. As the judge has said that now when Allah mentions them denying prophets, this is referring to the Jews and the Christians because they share in this quality. But as far as prophet killing, this is exclusively referring to the Jews. Close quote. Now what this is referring to then is when we're talking about what happened with the prophets. The prophets... Like the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Prophet Isa alayhi salam, the Prophet Zakariya, the Prophet Nabiuna Yahya alayhi salam, these two prophets, Yahya and Zakariya, were both murdered by the children of Israel. Other prophets besides them, like uh, Yashayahu, or mentioned as Isaiah, and other prophets besides them were also murdered. This is something that the children of Israel specifically share in because these are the ones who did the killing. As for the branch of people from the children of Israel that were later called Nasara, Christians or Nazareans, uh, these people were not the ones that tried to kill the Prophet Isa alayhi salam. So what's being referred to is the children of Israel 
from among the Nazareans or the Christians that denied the prophets, denying the Prophet Isa by worshipping him, or denying the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, by refusing to follow him, and the murder of two prophets, and there have been others through history that they killed. That's a quality particularly of the children of Israel. What we need to understand from this, um, what I would advise you, is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in these ayat what they did, that a group you deny and a group you kill, Allah has sent prophets repeatedly. And if you look in Surah Ali Imran, the third Surah 33, where Allah says, Indeed, Allah took the indeed Allah chose Adam, Nuh, the household of Ibrahim, and the household of Imran over the rest of humanity. And we've already discussed that in greater detail in Surah Ali Imran itself. You can start to put the pieces together on what happened with the prophets. And you can start to understand, number one, why there was a break between the prophets, between Nabi Isa and the Prophet Muhammad. You can understand that. And number two, you understand the punishment that Allah heaped upon them for killing prophets. Because what was the purpose of why prophets were sent? It's mentioned in this ayah itself. Messenger, convey the message that which you've been given. And if you don't convey it, you've not conveyed the message. And infallibility was composed as, was mentioned by the Imam of two parts. Infallibility from sin, and then the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was also given a second form of isma or infallibility or protection. And that was protection from being killed and from being captured or dying in captivity. Other prophets were not given this second form of infallibility. Because as we know, the other prophets, some were murdered. And so not all of the prophets had the second form of infallibility, but all of them had the first. The first was given by was, was conveyed on them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala since their creation, but the second one was given as a fadila or an additional blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you look at, say, the Prophet Zechariah, he was infallible, he committed no sins, but he was murdered. The Prophet Yahya alayhi salam, he was infallible, he committed no sins, but he was murdered. The Prophet Ishayahu alayhi salam, he was infallible, he committed no sins, but he was murdered. If you look at the Prophet Ilyas alayhi salam, infallible, committed no sins, he wasn't murdered, but he fled from his people. Ilyasa, he fled from his people. The Nabi Isa alayhi salam, the Prophet Isa alayhi salam, he fled from his people. But the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was different. He actually was protected from sin, infallible, but also protected from, from being uh, killed by them before his mission. So he completed his mission, he completed all of his actions, and then also he wasn't taken prisoner, and he was victorious over idolatry and kufr, and ultimately destroyed it. So because of that, you see that there's a qualitative difference between prophets. And that falls in with the sort with the sort within Surah Al Baqarah. When you look at the third Jews, those are the messengers. We preferred some of them over others. So we know that Allah prefers some messengers over others. Imam Ibn Jawzi rahimahullah, he then says, quote, and so the exalted one says further وَحَسِبُوا أَلَّا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةٌ فَعَمُوا وَصَمُّوا ثُمَّ تَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ ثُمَّ عَمُوا وَصَمُّوا كَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ وَاللَّهُ بَصِيرٌ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بُنُ مَرْيَمُ وقال المسيح يا بني إسرائيل اعبدوا الله ربي وربكم إنه من يشرك بالله فقد حرم الله عليه الجنة ومأواه النار وما للظالمين من أنصار لقد كفر الذين قالوا إن الله ثالث ثلاثة وما من إله إلا إله واحد وإن لم ينتهوا عما يقولون ليمسن الذين كفروا منهم عذاب أليم أفلا يتوبون إلى الله ويستغفرونه والله غفور رحيم ما المسيح بن مريم إلا رسول قد خلت من قبله الرسل وأمه صديقه 
كَانَا يَأْكُلَانِ الطَّعَامَ أَنظُرْ كَيْفَ نُبَيِّنُ لَهُمُ الْآيَاتِ ثُمَّ انظُرْ أَنَّا يُؤْفَكُونَ قُلْ أَتَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَمْلِكُ لَكُمْ ضَرًّا وَلَا نَفْعًا وَاللَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ <coughs> And they had imagined what no, they imagined that no tribulation or punishment would ever come over them, or tribulation. And so they became blind and deaf. And then, then thereafter Allah accepted their repentance and forgave them out of his mercy. But again, they became blind and deaf, and Allah knows all of what you do. Indeed, there are unbelievers who say, Allah is the Messiah, son of Maryam. Whereas the Messiah said himself, children of Israel, worship Allah, who is my Lord and your Lord. Indeed, whoever associates anyone with Allah, Allah has forbidden the paradise for such a one. And the abode of that one is the fire. And for the wrongdoers, there is no escape and for the oppressors, there is no way out. They are unbelievers, those who say Allah is the third of three, whereas there is no God except the one true God. And if they do not stop from this false charge, there is a painful punishment that awaits those who disbelieve from among them. Why do they not turn to Allah and seek His forgiveness? Indeed, Allah is the most forgiving, the most merciful. The Messiah, son of Maryam, was only a messenger. And there passed away before him many messengers. And his mother was a Siddiqah, a truthful one. They both used to eat food. Now look how we explain our signs to them and see how they turn away even after that. Say, do you worship besides Allah what has no power, what, what has no power to either give harm or benefit? And Allah is all hearing and all knowing? Say, people of the book, know that Allah is all hearing and all knowing. Do not exceed the limits in your religion. Do not follow the false and animalistic desires of the people who went astray before. And we had led astray others who had strayed from the right path. Surah Al-Ma'idah, the fifth surah, ayat 71 to 76. Now the exalted one said that when they imagined that they would have no tribulation, what that's referring to is they thought that they would not be tested, that they would not be called to account, that they would never be made to know what they had done was wrong. But in reality, this is what happened. And indeed, as Allah says, وَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْحَقُّ الْمُبِينَ Indeed, they know that Allah, He is the truth, the manifest. Surah An-Nur, the 24th Surah, 25th, 25th. And Allah also says, Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. Is it not the case that He knows that Allah sees all things? Surah Alaq, the 96th Surah, Ayah 14. So this, this Ayah and others like it are Ayat that are not questions in the term of looking for an answer, but they are. Statements that are used to elicit a response, interrogation, where Allah is asking these questions as confirmation to make them say, do you not see? Do you not understand? Is it not the case that you fear the commandments of Allah? These are used to elicit such a reaction. And this is the point that's being used. Just like when Allah says, أَمْ حَسِبَ الَّذِينَ اجْتَرَحُوا do those who were injured think that that their injury due to their sins that we shall not bring them anew for what they have done? Surah Al-Jafiya, Ayah 21. And do those who did sins not think that they will be brought back to us and that what they did does not come back to us? Surah Al-Ankabut, Ayah 4. أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا Do the people think that they will be left alone? Surah Al-Ankabut, Ayah 2. This, these and other ayat are similar in which they're being told, do not the people think, do not they reflect, meaning that this will not be the case. 
Meaning that, do they think that they will escape and Allah will not punish them or not test them by the killing of the prophets or the denying of the messengers? Do they not think that this will happen to them? Not that Allah is expressing doubt in himself, but are they thinking those being addressed? And so when Allah says that they became blind and they became dumb, as Zajjaj just said that this means that they're not acting by what they heard and what they saw of the signs. And they became like the blind and like the dumb. Then Allah forgave them, meaning he lifted the trial and tribulation from them and took the enemies away from them by victory. And he assisted them. And he sent to them. And so by saying that he had mercy upon them, one of the things that this means is that he sent to them the Prophet Muhammad wasallam to teach them that Allah will forgive them if they repent and show goodness and righteousness. But then they again became blinded and dumb. Meaning that they didn't repent after the trial was lifted. And they didn't repent after the sending of Muhammad wasallam. So they again fell into blindness and dumbness. And this happened to many of them. Many of them, just as you see. So these people suffered this tribulation. And this ayah was sent down on a people who they were upon kufr before the messenger of Allah وسلم, was sent to them. And once he was sent, they denied him out of hatred and enmity. And so what happened is that this action was only the end of their affair and showed once and for all that they were unbelievers. And these people did not believe that any tribulation would come to them due to their unbelief. But they were blind and deaf by their own falsehood when they left the truth. And then when Allah had mercy upon them, meaning that when he called them to repentance, by that he sent Muhammad wasallam, even if they didn't repent, then they would be blinded and deafened after the clarification of the truth in Muhammad wasallam, and many of them would suffer this faith. Now some of them would come to the faith, but all of them would not be gathered together in opposing the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Close quote Now what this is referring to is a couple of things Number one We have to go back to a couple of points If you remember the statement of Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anh, Where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Quoted an ayah in Surah At-Tawbah And an ayah in Surah Al-Saf The 61st Surah where it says, indeed Allah sent his messenger with the religion of truth and the guidance so that it might be dominant over all other religions, even though the idol worshippers may dislike it. And in the other ayah, even though the unbelievers may dislike it. That ayah, she said, because he was talking about the fact that a time will come in which people from my ummah shall worship idols after the passing of night and day and she said messenger of Allah how can this be and she recited this ayah and he said this ayah is true and after all of what's been mentioned in that ayah a cool wind shall come and every Muslim that smells that cool wind that breathes it in shall die and after that death None shall be left but the most wicked upon the face of the earth. At which time shaitan will say, What is it that you are to do? And the people will say, What do you command us to do? They are commanded, you are commanded that you are to worship the idols that your fathers of old worshipped. And they shall do so. And these shall see the final signs. But none will be able to believe that had not believed before when the sun rises from the west. That entire statement is taken from the Sahih of Imam Muslim under the chapter of the cool wind coming from the east. Now, in this hadith, there are a number of things that, are, that have occurred that are linked with this ayah. One is that sometimes the Prophet Muhammad and we discussed this before, the two types of ummahs. The ummah that belongs to those in his dispensation, that belong to the period in which he appeared in, they're his ummah in that sense that he's declaring the faith to them. So the unbelievers of this time 
starting from his birth all the way up until this time, the unbelievers in that time, up until the day of resurrection, are from his ummah in the sense that they belong to his dispensational period. But there's a second type which we discussed, ummah, is those who are from his ummah in the sense that they believe in him. And he says that they're from his ummah. So when those that believe that are from his ummah die, it leaves nothing left except for those who he had declared the mission to when he appeared from the beginning all the way up until the end of time. These people fall under two things. <clears throat> because you, you can't talk about the two ummahs unless you talk about the two declarations. The two declarations. There are two types of declaration that Allah makes to the creation. Two types of declaration. The declaration of Ad-Dawatul um, Ijaba, the declaration of answer or response, the declaration of response, and Ad-Dawatul Ijaba, that means that the declaration to those of the declaration of response is to those who can answer. Those who can answer are those who become Muslims. And they belong to his ummah in the sense that they are those who answer. So this is the call of those who respond. There's a second call. Ad-Dawatul Iqaba. The call of condemnation. The call of condemnation is for those who cannot answer because they are unbelievers, but they affirm the truth of what Allah said, although they cannot answer. Their proof is in that same hadith in the Sahih of Imam Muslim that I gave you, where the unbelievers say when they see the sun rising from the west, they will want to believe but will not be able to as no soul will not be will, no soul will be able to believe that had not before the prophet sallallahu said that the door of tauba of repentance remains wide open as long as the soul has not reached the upper throat lam yughadghir the soul has not reached the upper part of the throat and the sun has not risen from the west that's the hadith in Sahih al jamah Once either of those things occurs, the door of tawbah, repentance, is shut, and it is impossible for someone who had not repented before to repent at that point. It is impossible at that point. So then, the question remains. Because it's because it mentions in the ayah that they were blinded and then deafened. Then Allah had mercy upon them. Then they were blinded and deafened. And you say, well, wait a minute, hold on. If they became blind and deaf, then they became blind and deaf again by rejecting. Then they never believed in the first place. Exactly. Exactly. So then what does this ayah mean Allah had mercy upon them? The imam has just told you and the others have already told you that it means that he sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He sent them, as the Imam said, to be a condemnation when they could not believe. And that those who would believe could respond. So this ayah, someone could ask, well, what is the point of this ayah when we're looking at the fact that there's these people that they become blind and deaf. Then Allah sends them the mercy of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to come. Then they become blind and deaf, many of them, meaning that there's some that stay like this. And Allah knows all of what they do. These are people who Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knew that they wouldn't become believers because the Messenger of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you read in the Qur'an, that the Qur'an is a shafa' for who? Believers or unbelievers? Believers. Believers. There's no mention where Allah says that the Quran is a shafa for the kuffar. There's no, there's no such mention. They can't. How can they? Because they can't benefit from it. You can't. You can't benefit from something. You can't get barakah or deeds from something that you are in rejection and rebellion towards. So, finally, closing this up, then what does this, what is this referring back to? We are back to the point of the fact that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has preordained affairs. 
preordained. Then you come back with a question, well, what do we do about Dawa? What do we do about Dawa? If everyone is condemned, except for those who believe, forget it. There's no point calling anyone because everyone's already finished. To which my response is, and the response of the scholars are, is um, do you know who the remnant are and who's saved and who's condemned? No. No, you don't know who's saved and who's condemned. Well then, because you don't know that information, then you have to preach to everyone with the understanding that some of them may become Muslim and some of them might not. Might not. But you don't know who's in condemnation and who's not. And by you not knowing that, that doesn't lift your responsibility. Now, if you did and you knew every single one, well, then you could know. And then you could say, these ones I won't speak to and these ones I will. This is why sometimes the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave a lengthy message and an address. And people would come forward. If you read in the Hadith in Bukhari, he rejects some people. They come forward and they say that, oh, I want to become Muslim. He said, and maybe not. He said, what? These people, they want the Dawah. They want the Islam. No, they don't. Because he knows who the people are that will become Muslim and who won't. This is why. When you understand that, then you understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Qada and his Qadr. You understand all of what you need to know. What you need to know. Not what you want to know. What you need to know. Because there's a lot of things we want to know about Allah's Qada and Qadr. That's none of your business. We understand the things that we need to know. What we need to know is that the vast majority of the human race is condemned. We must call to the faith. Those that do not answer the call are condemned. We do not know those who are eternally condemned. So we must call. We must call. But if someone is able to respond to the message, they couldn't respond unless Allah made it possible for them to respond. And the fact that they were able to respond to the message is the proof that they belong to the remnant. But if you say, I, I spoke to someone, they became Muslim, then they rejected faith, well then that is the proof that they, were never, they never belonged to the remnant. Because no one... If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives, some, gives someone salvation and he saves them to go to paradise forever, can someone resist the will of Allah? Can someone resist the will of Allah? Can the clouds say, no, we're not raining. Allah says, you have to rain. I've preordained to rain. They say, no, we're not going to do it. Can they do that? No, they can't. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the sun is going to be 93 million miles from the earth, it's going to weigh this many, it will take 45,000 earths to make it, can the sun say, no, it's actually it's going to be 46 earths, I'm going to increase in size. It can't do it. Because it is governed by laws that it must adhere to. Just like there are human beings that are governed by laws. So, if, so someone can't say, when Allah says this one's preordained to become Muslim, they can't say, no, I will not become Muslim and fight it. There's no way for them to fight it. They will believe. And someone that rejects faith cannot say, no, I must reject faith. I must become Muslim. Because the Islam guidance, Iman, is not yours. Iman comes from Allah. So when you understand that, then you understand that it's not you that's keeping you in Islam. Oh, my Iman is low. It's not your Iman. So how can you quantify something that's not yours? The companions never spoke like this. The early generations never spoke. My iman is low. Well, if it's low, then you're out of the faith because the only, only increase and decrease in iman, the increase is when you come into the faith, the decrease is if you go out. It's impossible. So the one that keeps you in this faith is Allah. Whether you're a 51% good Muslim, whether you're a 49% good Muslim, whether you're a 26% good Muslim, and then you have your up and down days as a Muslim, oh, I'm just a lousy Muslim today. Okay, but you're still Muslim with Allah. Oh, I'm a 100% Muslim today. That's okay, but that's got nothing to do with the basis of why you're Muslim with Allah. That's good that you're obedient, that you're more obedient. And Allah loves that you obey Him more, but that's not the condition of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you a believer and saved you. Not because of what you could give Him, because you've got nothing to give Him. you got nothing. You are nothing. He created you. So you have to understand the basis of that. Now someone could say, oh, well, people that uh, depend on this, it could lead to stagnation and... Uh, and uh, 
it could lead to determinism and people don't move ahead in life. Let me tell you something. The people that believed this built 70 hospitals in Baghdad, sailed the then known world, wrote a map of the entire world that had all the continents on it, knew what was on the other side, made it to the northern part of California by 693 AD, and traveled the strait before Magellan did, made it to southern Africa before Magellan did, found Madagascar before the people that invaded Madagascar found it, brought Islam to the Philippines, to Indonesia, to Malaysia. No, these are the same people who believe what I'm telling you today. And it didn't stop them at all from giving da'wah or preaching Islam or being productive or building hospitals or uh, building retreats or building madrasas or being involved in medicine or math. Not at all. Not at all. These are the people that brought the faith. It's when you drop that that you suffer tribulations. The Imam then says, Rahimahullah, he says, quote, The exalted one has also said, they have disbelieved those who say the Messiah is Allah is the Messiah, son of Maryam. Now what this is referring to is that Muqatil says it was sent down regarding the Christians of Najran. And the Messiah was among them. And he told them, whoever associates partners with Allah, Allah has forbidden for them the paradise. And then Allah says, already Allah, already they've disbelieved those who say indeed Allah is of three. Mujahid said, these are referring to the Christians. Wahab ibn Munabbih, Wahab ibn Munabbih said, when the Prophet Isa was born, there was not a single idol except that it fell down on its face. The demons went to Iblis and they informed him of what happened. So he went out traveling the different areas of the earth. And then he came back and he said, The one that's just been born has been born without a father. Let me go look at him right now. And so he found a group of the angels circumambulating going to his mother. And he moved among a group. And went in the form of a man among the angels. And he came to the temple of the children of Israel. While they were speaking about the Prophet Isa alayhi salam. And they said, he's been born without a father. Iblis remarked, this is not a human being. But it is Allah. And Allah wanted that he came in the form of a woman to inform the slaves of who he was. But one of those with him said, no, that's not possible. Indeed, Allah wanted that he should be born and come in the form of a child. And then the third said, no, no, that's not possible. But he wanted that he would be declared a God in the earth and he would come and show the people how to worship him. So this speech that was said by Iblis and those with him was then inserted among the people and popularized among them. And the people began to break into groups. And the people suffered because of this. Muhammad ibn Ka'ab also mentioned that when Isa ascended, 100 of the scholars of the children of Israel gathered together. And they broke into four groups because of this issue. One group said that he was Allah. And he was the Lord that had come down into the earth. And there was no beginning for him. And he had only gone to the sky because there was no way that he could undergo death. He gave life to the death, to the dead, healed the sick and the lepers, and no one can do that except Allah. So he must be the Lord. The second group said, no, that is not true. Because we knew Isa. We knew his mother. But he's the son of Allah. The third group said, no, no, that's not true at all. What the two, of you, what the two groups have said, that's wrong. But he and his mother just both came from normal human stock. And his mother is guilty of fornication. The fourth group said, No, you've said something false, Do you, you in the third group. He is the slave of Allah and his messenger and his word. And they went out differing with one another. And each group had its followers from the people. The scholars of commentary have said that the Christians have said that Godhead is shared and is known among among. Allah 
Isa and Maryam. And every one of them is deity. And then the eye is the emphasis that's mentioned. But the meaning of third of three is referring to three gods. Of three. A group of three. Because the meaning understood is that it's talking about whoever said that he is of three. And Allah said, there is no God except for the one unique God. So whoever should say that he is one of three, he Allah is one of three, then they have disbelieved. And that's why Allah says there is no God but the one true God. And this type of phraseology in Arabic is emphasis. Is emphasis. And those who disbelieve from among them, they know that they're standing on a false word. And those who disbelieve shall be taken by a punishment. And those who say that the Messiah, he is Allah, and those who say indeed Allah is of three, and every unbeliever that travels their way shall have a terrible punishment indeed. Close quote. Now, there's a couple of points here that have to be remembered. One of the things that needs to be kept in mind is, firstly, the understanding of the Eastern Orthodox Church. The Eastern Orthodox Church, when they discuss the Prophet Isa alayhi salam, they use an expression for his mother, in which in Greek it is Theotokos, which means the God-bearer. This in Arabic literally means Walidatullah, which literally means the one who gives birth to Allah. And they believe that she is the one who lent a human nature to the Prophet Isa alayhi salam, who was pure deity. And that he is the God-man, bearing two natures. They often refer to him as Theanthropus, the God-man. He has two natures, divine and human. When he eats and drinks, this is his human nature. When he speaks prophetically, this is his divine nature. This led to other issues because due to the fact that the Eastern Orthodox do believe in the doctrine of original sin, it created an issue about pure deity being in a sinful vessel. So they said that Maryam as Sadiq alayhi salam was not guilty of the original sin because she was not stained with it. And then more questions in theology came, well, was her mother Hanna and her father Imran? Well, no, her mother Hanna wasn't. Was the mother of Hanna stained with original sin? And it became this issue where they had to somehow prove that none of the women forebearers of Maryam alayhi salam were stained with original sin. Then came the discussion of the Immaculate Conception, which was that Maryam as Sadiq alayhi salam came about through special means and was not touched by original sin. Then came the doctrine of the Queen of Heaven, where she was declared to be the Queen of Heaven and that she was not touched with major sin. She did not die an earthly death. And she is called the chief mediatrix. So if you go to uh, Eastern Orthodox churches, Arab in the Arab world and otherwise, you will see them reading the Subuhat of Maryam, the glorifications of Maryam. And they say, the Our Lady Mary, and they use a number of other glorifications, one of which asks for the forgiveness of sins. So they do believe that there is a sharing between themselves and between the divine. And that they believe that there's a link between Allah, the Prophet Isa Islam, and Maryam alayhi salam. They believe that there's a link that's there. The second issue that, is, uh, that deserves consideration is their belief in the Trinity. Now, the belief in the Trinity, Trinity is coming from the Latin root Trinitas, which means to make three. They believe that there was one true God in three persons. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit is God. And these three are the one true God. All of them are pre-eternal of the same substance. This is problematic 
when you bring this to the Muslim because of one reason. The Muslim, when you say, when the Muslim says to the Christian, do we worship the same God? Yes. The Muslim immediately says, no, this is wrong. Because the Arabic word that's used for Allah, one of the words that's used for one of his names, Al-Wahid. Al-Wahid. There are two words for one in Arabic. I think I mentioned this before, but I will mention again in case I've, I'm mistaken and I mentioned it in a, in a lecture that wasn't recorded. Ahad means one of something. Ahad. And Ahad is usually used to refer to the fact that other gods don't exist. Qul huwa Allahu Ahad. Say, he is Allah, he is Ahad. So the other gods do not, do not exist. And he, Allah, is Ahad. He's one. There's another type of wahid though. Wahid in Arabic means that the one bearing this title is one in his essence, in his names, and in his attributes. One in his essence, his names, and his attributes. Now when you pre when when uh, Baba Shanuda, the Pope of the Coptics, was pressed on this issue. Is Allah wahid? He, in his honesty, he said no. Because that's correct from, Christ, from the position of Christianity, which means he is a pagan. Inadvertently, he declared himself a pagan because he cannot rightly say he's wahid because he would deny that Allah has plurality in his essence, which is precisely what Christianity believes. We believe that Allah is one, not just one, but unique. Because Atan is one, Ra is one, right? Monarchta is one. It's not just one that we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that Allah is one and that is unique. So the other false gods don't exist and Allah is one and unique in his names, his attributes, and his essence. There's nothing of any of these that Allah shares with anyone else. He is one in totality and unique. So that's why it says, La ilaha illallah. Wahdahu la sharika la. There is no God but Allah. He is one. Wahdahu, He in Himself is one. Wahdahu la sharika la. And there is no partner for Him. That's what that means. So if anyone comes with anything else, no matter how it's dressed up, no matter what type of smoke and mirrors are used, Allah is one and unique. The Imam Rahimullah, he then says, quote, and so the exalted one is also said, do they not repent to Allah? Now this, this wording is in the form of a question, but its meaning is a command. Let them repent to Allah. Like when Allah says, فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ تَهُونَ Will they not abstain from this? Surah Al-Ma'idah, the fifth surah, ayah 91. Now the exalted one said, "The Messiah, son of Maryam, is only a messenger. This is a refu this is a refutation of the Jews for their denying his message, but it's also a refutation of the Christians for claiming that he has deity. So it means that he's not deity, and his judgment is the judgment of those who preceded him before from the messengers, and his mother is a Siddiqa. This is a refutation." of those from among the Jews who declared her to be a fornicatress. As Zajjaj has said that the word as siddiqa means that the one bearing this title is the highest form of truthful. And the highest form of being noble. And they both ate food. Allah says they both ate food. Meaning that they both became hungry and took their fill from food. And the fact that they eat food is proof that they're not deity. And anything that eats food is created. And anything that eats food is temporal. Because the fact that it eats food means it requires energy. It's tired. It's weakened. And Allah is Al-Aziz. The mighty. 
And you look at the words of the Exalted One where he says, look how we clarify to them our signs, meaning that we show them the clear proofs, the clear evidences, and we show the lies that have been given. Close quote. Now just a very quick point here. So the word as very few women historically have had this title given to them. Maryam as is referred to by this title in this ayah. And Aisha as That makes you understand how we're supposed to view Aisha radiallahu anha. Remember, in Surah Al-Ahzab, the 33rd surah, ayat 4 onwards, Allah says that the wives of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa are our mothers. So these women, we are to hold them in an attitude that is greater than our own mothers. Imam ibn Jawzi rahimahullah, he says, quote, And when Allah says, say, Do you worship from besides Allah what cannot give you any protection, harm or help you? This was sent down because of a number of incidents. Muqatil said, Tell the Christians, it's, it's as if it's saying, Tell the Christians of Najran, Do you worship besides Allah, meaning Isa ibn Maryam? What doesn't give harm in this life or help in the hereafter? But Allah hears their words. Because when they say the Messiah is the son of Allah, or one of three, he knows what they're saying. And they will be called to account. And they will most certainly be brought to bear on what it is that they said before. And the exalted one has said, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ لَا تَغْلُوا فِي دِينِكُمْ غَيَّرَ الْحَقِّ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا أَهْوَاءَ قَوْمٍ قَدْ ضَلُّوا مِنْ قَبْلُ قَبْلُ وَأَضَلُّوا كَثِيرًا وَضَلُّوا عَنْ سَوَاءِ السَّبِيلِ عَنْ سَوَاءِ السَّبِيلِ لعن الذين كفروا من بني إسرائيل على لسان داود وعيسى وعيسى بن مريم ذلك بما عصوا وكانوا يعتدون كانوا لا يتناهون عما عما فعلوه لبئس ما كانوا يفعلون ترى كثيرا منهم يتولون الذين كفروا لبئس ما قدمت لهم أنفسهم أن سخط الله عليهم وفي العذاب هم خالدون وَلَوْ كَانُوا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالنَّبِيِّ وَمَا أُنْزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مَا اتَّخَذُوهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءَ مَا اتَّخَذُوهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءَ وَلَكِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ لا تجدن أشد الناس عداوة للذين آمنوا اليهود والذين أشركوا ولا تجدن أقربهم مودة للذين آمنوا الذين قالوا إن نصارا ذلك بأن منهم قسيسين ورهبانا وأنهم لا يستكبرون <coughs> Saying, people of the book, do not transgress the boundaries in your religion and do not follow the desires of a people who went astray before and have led astray many others and have strayed from the path. Cursed were those who disbelieved from the children of Israel on the tongue of Dawood and Isa, the son of Maryam. This is because they disobeyed and used to transgress. They did not forbid one, other, one another from the evils they used to commit. Indeed, evil is that which they used to do. You will see many of them making friends with the unbelievers. Evil indeed is that which their souls have sent, before, sent forth for them, and that which they used to bring about the wrath of Allah because of, 
and in torment will they abide forever. If they believed in Allah and the Prophet, that which had been sent down to, the, down to him, they would not have taken them for their friends, but most of them are transgressors. You will find that the most the people who have the most enmity against the Muslims are the Jews and the, un, and the idol worshippers. And you will find the nearest in friendship to the believers those who say, we are Christians. This is because among them are men of learning and monks, and they are not a proud people. Surah Al-Ma'idah, the fifth surah, ayat 77 to 82. So the exalted one has said, Say, people of the book. Muqatil has said that it's referring to the fact that the people of Najran, they're not to exaggerate in their religion. And they are to not they are not to say other than the truth regarding Isa. We've already defined the word ghulu, exaggeration, at the end of Surah An Nisa. And when the exalted one says, and do not follow the path or the ways of desire of the people who went astray from before. Abu Suleyman al-Damashqi has said, do not follow the path of those who went astray from before, lest you go, you go astray. And those who went astray were the leaders of falsehood from the Jews and also from the Christians. And this is a warning for those in the time of, the, of our Prophet wasallam who were forbidden from following their example because of the innovations that they brought about. And these people from the children of Israel were cursed on the tongue of Dawood and Isa. Now, their, cur their being cursed has to do with two things. Number one, they were cursed because they are far from the mercy of Allah. Ibn Abbas عنه, said they were cursed on the tongue of Dawood and they became apes. And they were cursed on the tongue of Isa in the Injil, as mentioned by Zajjaj. Now, it should also be remembered that Dawood and Isa were informed that Muhammad was a Prophet wasallam, And they also cursed whoever disbelieved in him. Now, the transformation that happened to them, as mentioned by Mujahid, by their being cursed on the tongue of Dawood and their becoming apes, and on the tongue of Isa and they became swine. This is what occurred, and this is indeed true, and it happened in the physical sense. Al Hassan and Qatada ibn Da'ima have said the people who violated the Sabbath were cursed on the tongue of Dawood because they transgressed. Dawood said, Allah, curse them and make them a sign for others. So they were transformed into apes. The people who asked for the table spread with food to be sent down were cursed on the tongue of Isa because when they ate from it, they didn't believe when they saw this miracle. And so Isa said, Allah, curse the people who violated this way. And so these people, when he said, curse the people who are violating that which was sent down, they were declared to be swine or pigs. And that is because of the fact that they disobeyed. So the curse was because of their disobedience to Allah and their opposition to his command and to his prohibition. And their enmity to Allah in all of that which he forbade them from in the first place. And they never forbade from the wrong and they did so. So they went headlong into that which was forbidden. And the scholars of commentary have mentioned that the munkar that they ran into was fishing on the day of Saturday when they were forbidden from any work on the Sabbath. Secondly, taking bribes in order to give successful judgments or to, or, or, or to overturn rulings. And thirdly, eating or consuming usury and eating the fat of the animals in the form of a paste. And this is the munkar that has been mentioned. And so they were warned from doing this. And it was related from the Prophet ﷺ that he said, There was a man from the children of Israel. When he saw his brother doing a sinful thing, he forbade him from it. And when it was the next day, he didn't forbid him, even though he saw him doing that. And he saw him taking from it. 
and doing other things in addition to the sinful things, and he left him. And he, and he still, he stayed as a companion with him, ate with him, drank with him, and intermingled with him. And once this was shown, Allah sent against the hearts of those people wickedness. And he cursed them according to the tongue on the tongues of Dawood and Isa ibn Maryam alayhim as salam. And this is collected by Imam Abu Dawood. And evil is that which they did, meaning the wickedness that they did, that is indeed evil, and they will be punished for that. And you will see many of them turning to those who are unbelievers. So many of them turning means that they're turning to the hypocrites as narrated from Ibn Abbas, Al-Hasan and Mujahid. But they're also turning to other Jews, as mentioned by Muqatil. And this is the fact of the matter. And Allah says about them in the past that they are those who have a disease in their hearts and they move quickly towards evil. Now regarding those who disbelieve, these are referring to the Jews, but they're also referring to the idol worshippers of the Arabs, their heads, because they are asking them for assistance. And evil is what their hands have put forward when they made their evil plans, and they brought the wrath of Allah upon themselves. And this has to do with the fact that they hid what was in their heart and what were their true intentions. And Allah's wrath came upon them and exposed them. And this is the truth of the matter. The exalted one said, you will find the people who have the most enmity towards the, those who believe to be the Jews. The scholars of commentary say this ayah was sent down and what came after because of what happened regarding Najashi and his companions. Sa'id ibn Jubayr said that Najashi sent people to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and they became Muslim. So this ayah was sent down and that which is after came as well. Now we will mention their story coming shortly. But we ask that you remain patient while we look over the rest of this. As Zajjaj has mentioned, that this ayah is an ayah that's emphasizing, you will surely find, meaning that it's for definite, where Allah is actually swearing by himself, that you, I swear by myself, you will find that these are the people who have the most enmity towards the Muslims, both the Jews and the idol worshippers. And they have a hatred towards the Muslims. And those who I worship and those who are idol worshippers, meaning those who worship idols. As for those who said we are Christians, then is this general in all the Christians or is it specific? When it says that the closest to them are the Christians. There are two statements you need to keep in mind. One is that it is specific. Because and Najashi is the one, and his companions are the ones that became Muslim and have the most love towards the Muslims. Not every single Christian, as mentioned by Ibn Abbas and Ibn Jubayr. Secondly, is that they're people from the Christians who also took hold of the revealed law that was left over with Isa. And when the Prophet Muhammad wasallam came, they became Muslims. This is mentioned by Qatada. In addition to that, it can also be said to be general among the Christians because they tend to be less in imitation to the idol worshippers and less in assistance towards the idol worshippers than the Jews. And Allah says that is because among them are qissisin. That is because among, of, among them, from the heads of the Christians are scholars and monks who stay in their cloisters. There are scholars and monks who stay in their cloisters and they are not arrogant. Now, the question that will come to someone's mind is this one. If it said, why did Allah praise them when among them are these scholars and monks and the idea of being a monk is not from our, our sharia why did Allah praise them for that the answer to this question 
is the following. Allah praised them because they held fast to the religion of Isa. And when the time came for the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, they took what was in their book that they had left over. And those who were monks were hard working in their religion and believed. So, so because there were among them scholars that took heed of what Isa said regarding the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, then because of that, they believed and they listened and they accepted the news because they were already a humble people. Al-Qadi Abu Ya'la has said that it's also referring to the fact that the thought and care of an ignorant person in this ayah, Allah has praised the Christians, but this is wrong. Because praise is the one praise is only for those who believe from among them. And there's no doubt that what the Christians say is more ugly than that which the Jews say in terms of their idolatry. So Allah is praising those who believed from among them. And then Allah said, because they're not a proud people, meaning that they're not too proud in following the truth. Close quote. Now, the import, now this is important from one standpoint. And here's how. When, when you're looking at the difference between the Jews and the Christians, the Jews and the Christians are coming from two different standpoints. You have the Jews who deny are denying two prophets, are the killers of prophets, but are denying two prophets. The Prophet Isa alayhi salam and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa This is the difference. In addition to that, the Christians have among them monks, along with their scholars. Monks and scholars. And monks, one of the things they're taught is humility, and they spent their days reading their book, being humble, and trying to break their soul of bad habits. So when the Prophet Muhammad wasallam comes, before his 40th year, he's on a business trip with his uncle to Sham, who is the first one that comes out to meet him while he's there in Sham? A monk, Bahira. Why? Because Bahira spent his time Staying away from things that will cause him to become arrogant. Staying away from wickedness. And ultimately that led him to reject the idolatry that he saw among his own people. And so you'll often find that some of the first people that became Muslims were the monks. And the high ranking people in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Because they understood what Islam was. They understood the ramifications of what Islam was. They understood what they'd be facing. And these weren't people who had a lack of discipline. They understood exactly what Islam meant. If they became Muslim, they understood the chances they were taking, the risks they, uh, the risks that that uh, that were posed to them, the risk that Islam posed to their life if they implemented it, and all the other possible avenues of danger. These people already knew about it. If you tell them to restrain their nefs, that's one thing the monks could do was to restrain themselves. At least the Eastern Orthodox monks could restrain themselves. Because their celibacy, and again, this is another difference between the Eastern churches and the Western churches. The Roman rite of the Catholic Church, the celibacy of their priests was self-imposed. The celibacy of Eastern Orthodox monks is, is, is self-imposed in a different way. By self-imposed in the, in the Roman rite, it means that it's imposed externally by the church. If someone wants to be a Christian, it's, it's externally imposed on the self. If someone wants to be a monk in the Eastern Orthodox Church, they themselves make that decision whether or not they want to be celibate. Now, with all the cases that have been happening between this, the church of this land litigation and the Catholic Church in Ireland and in Boston, the United States. The child molestation charges. Why? Because men were forced to be celibate and they didn't want to be. And their normal uh, sexual desires came out in depraved ways. So they became depraved. But the Eastern Orthodox churches, if you look at the Coptic, the Syrian Orthodox, the Chaldeans, the Russian, look at the cases of molestation in their churches. It's far less. 
It's far less. Because these men, because you have some of them that are not celibate, that are married, and some of them that have voluntarily taken it upon themselves because they want to do it. And there's a total difference between them. When you understand that wisdom, then you can look at it and say, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is praising not their acts of celibacy, because in later ayat, Allah says that their celibacy was not correct. He's not praising their celibacy and their other things, but he's praising them for believing in the truth when it came to them. Because many of these people were quite old when the truth came, and they accepted the truth without being afraid. So Bahira, uh, radiallahu an, when he first met the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked a number of questions, and he said, this is the one. This is the very one. But he wanted to be sure. So he, so he saw a cloud hovering over the tree where they were seated at. And this, you can find this in the seer of Ibn Hisham. It's well known. He found a tree hovering over their camp, over the tree that they were under. A, uh, a cloud hovering over their tree. And he came down to speak with the caravan. And he offered them a banquet of food. And they were happy with their good treatment, but they, found, they, felt, they felt strange that they were being treated in such a noble manner when they had come there so many times before and he'd never treated them in this fashion. And he asked, he asked them, is everyone among you here? And they said, well, everyone is here except the young boy. He's off near the, the pack camels and he's near the luggage. And he said, call him. I want everyone to be seated here. So they called the young boy. And he sits down. And Bahira looks at him very carefully. And he's watching him eat. And he watches the boy mention the name of Allah and then begin eating. And he said to the, he asked the boy, he said, I ask you by lat, I swear by lat, what? What will you tell me about yourself? And he looked up and he said, I don't like that name. Mention the name of Allah only. Never mention idols in front of me. And so he said, that's one thing. And he said, I know this is one thing about this young man that's true. So then he said to the young, the young boy, he said, tell me what it is that you do when you get up and what you do in your day. So he explained basic things about himself. Then he also saw on his back the seal of prophethood, which looked like an ostrich egg, and it had small hairs growing out of it, and this was the stamp in the middle of his back. So he saw this was the second sign. Then he said, whose son, to Abu Talib, he said, whose son is this young boy? He said, well, he's my son, because he adopted the Arab custom of adoption. You would say, the boy was your son. He said, you can't be his father because the father of this one has to die before he was born. And his mother has to be dead before he's 10. And Abu Talib became very scared. And he said, listen, his father died before he was born. And his mother died years after he was born. I'm his uncle. And Bahira, Bahira he said, take care of him. And be very careful lest, lest the Jews get a hold of him and kill him. And Bahira left promptly because he was scared about the fact that this man knew this much information about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he'd not met him before. But he knew this information precisely because this man had spent his time studying and knowing about the faith, studying in his book what was left of the revelation, studying in other books. He'd spent his time, he'd exhausted his time. And because of this, he'd left idolatry. This man was pure upon the faith. Now, Imam ibn Jawzi, rahimahullah, uh, he brings us back to the text. Now, I want to mention that we are now at the portion where we are in the seventh juz, or the thirteenth hizb. Okay? This is called al-juz wa idha sami'u. This is the name of this Jews. وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا Okay, this is this Jews. So we are in Jews number 7. Or in this case, Hizb number 13. Alright, so only 47 more Hizb to go. And only, thir and only 23 more Jews to go. So we're getting close. What I would also say is, 
if you can familiarize yourself with the juz and with the hizb system, maybe if you have time, you could try to dedicate yourself to reading through the Qur'an in a language that you understand once every 60 days or once every 30 days. By, by seeing that this system is here, maybe you could do that and get extra reward from Allah. So if you say, okay, if you say to yourself, a khatam every seven days is too much. I can't do that. It's just too hard on me. Okay? What about ten days? Ten days is just too hard. I can't, I can't do it. The dedication required is too great. I can't bear that burden. Very well then. What about thirty days? Well, thirty days sounds more workable. I'll try that. But suppose halfway through it becomes too hard. Well, then try sixty days. So there's a system for everyone. Seven days, you have three days, seven days, 30 days, 60 days. Obviously, if you go a year, that's fine, but it's not the same. Try to get reward for reading from the speech of Allah. Try to get that reward. Try to look, try to go for it as much as you can. And you'll see that Allah will favor you and bless you. Try to get the reward. Imam al rahimahullah, he then says, Quote, and so the exalted one, he has given us the truth in this regard when he has mentioned about them that they have priests and that they have monks and that they have scholars from among them. Then Allah mentions about what happens to them when they hear the truth. He says, وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ تَرَى أَعْيُنَهُمْ تَفِيضُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ مِمَّا عَرَفُوا مِنَ الْحَقِّ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا آمَنَّا فَاكْتُبَنَا مَعَ الشَّاهِدِينَ وَمَا لَنَا لَا نُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَمَا جَاءَنَا مِنَ الْحَقِّ وَنَطَمَعُ أَنْ يُدْخِلَنَا رَبُّنَا مَعَ الْقَوْمِ الصَّالِحِينَ فَأَثَابَهُمُ اللَّهُ بِمَا قَالُوا جَنَّاتٍ تَجَرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارُ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَذَلِكَ جَزَاءُ الْمُحْسِنِينَ وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَكَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا أُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ الْجَحِيمِ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تُحَرِّمُوا طَيِّبَاتِ مَا أَحَلَّ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ وَكُلُوا مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ حَلَالًا طَيِّبًا وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي أَنْتُمْ بِهِ مُؤْمِنُونَ لَا يُؤَاخِذُكُمُ اللَّهُ بِاللَّغْوِ فِي أَيْمَانِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ يُؤَاخِذُكُمْ بِمَا عَقَّدْتُمُ الْأَيْمَانِ فكفارته إطعام عشرة مساكين من أوسط ما تطعمون أهليكم أو كسوتهم أو تحرير رقبه فمن لم يجد في الصيام ثلاثة أيام ذلك كفارة أيمانكم إذا حلفتم واحفظوا أيمانكم كذلك يبين الله لكم آياته لعلكم تشكرون. And when they hear what was sent down to the messenger, you see their eyes overflowing with tears from what they know of the truth. They say, Our Lord, we believe. So write us among write us with those who are witnesses. What's wrong with us that we don't believe in Allah and what came of the truth? And that we want to be entered with our Lord along with those pious people. So because of what they said, Allah rewarded them with the paradise under which rivers flow forever therein. That is the reward of the righteous ones. Those who disbelieve and they reject our signs, they are the people of the great fire. You who believe do not declare as impermissible the good things that Allah declared as permitted for you and do not transgress. Indeed, Allah does not love the transgressors. But eat from that which Allah has provided for you as sustenance that is pure and holy and permitted. 
and fear Allah who you believe in. Allah shall not take you to account for what you did not intend in the oaths that you made, but he will take you to account for that which you purposely included. The expiation for any such oath is to feed ten poor people from the best of that which you eat, of, from the best of that which your family eat, or to clothe them, or to free one slave. Whoever is not able to do that should fast three days. That is the expiation of your oaths when you swear them. Take care and guard your oaths when you make them. Likewise, Allah makes clear to you his signs so that you might be thankful. Surah Al-Ma'idah, the fifth surah, ayat 83 to 89. So Allah's response to those people that believed was to say that when they heard the truth. Now there were 12 men. Seven from the Qissisin, seven from the Qissisin, and five from the monks. And when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, recited to them the Quran, they all wept and they believed. And this ayah was sent down. Write us with the witnesses, meaning whoever bears witness of the truth. And that which they bear witness of the truth of was Muhammad and his Ummah as mentioned by Ali ibn Abi Talha and Ikrimah from Ibn Abbas. And secondly, the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as also mentioned by Ibn Abbas. And thirdly, they bear witness that they are people of Iman. As said by Al-Hasan. And number four, that they believe in the prophets. And what's wrong with us that we don't believe in Allah, meaning that that they don't accept the faith? No. In the people of righteousness, they are those who have accepted the faith and gone fully into it. And those righteous people who they want to be with are the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the early community of immigrants. And that is the reward for the righteous people, meaning the reward of the believers. And then Allah says, you who believe do not declare as impermitted the wholesome things that Allah has made permitted for you. There are three reasons why this ayah was sent down. One is that there were people from the companions of the Prophet wasallam, like Uthman ibn Mad'un, who said that they would declare meat and women impermissible for themselves. And they wanted to expend effort on themselves so that they could focus on their worship. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, in response said, I never commanded anyone to do that. And so this ayah was sent down. As is mentioned by Ibn Abbas. Now there were, there were a group of people who also discussed this in detail. And they were Abu Bakr, Omar, Ali, Ibn Mas'ud, Uthman ibn Mad'un, Al-Miqdad ibn Al-Aswad, Salim, the freed slave of Hudayfa, Salman al-Farisi, Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, Ammar ibn Yasir. And all of these people came together in the house of Uthman ibn Mad'un. And they said that they would leave off meet and getting married to their wives because they wanted to focus on worship. When this reached the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, whoever leaves my sunnah, then he is not from me. And this is collected by Ibn Jarir in his commentary. So the reason for this is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam declared his sunnah. And when he sat with them and recited to them the verses, some of them felt fear. And this is why they were adamant on doing those actions. Because they sat in their houses, they stayed away from their women, they only took on very rough clothes, and they kept away from the good food and clothes except what they had to eat. And they wore rough clothes like some of the people that practiced monkery among the children of Israel and thought that this was good 
And they stayed awake all night for the night prayer and fasted even in the daytime. And it's for this that this ayah was sent down. A man came to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, one day and he said, I've eaten from this meat, but I've also spent time with my wives, but from this day forward I declare this impermissible for myself. And so he reci- the Prophet وسلم, recited this ayah to him as a warning. This was also a warning to Abdullah ibn Rawaha, who wasn't present. But he did say to his wife, Have the guests eaten? And she said, They're waiting for you. He said, No, don't delay my guests because of me. Look at what you've done. Your food for me is haram. And she said, Is it haram for me? Why don't you eat it? And the guests said, If you take this attitude, then it's haram for me if you don't eat it. So when Ibn Ruwaha saw that, he said, Look at the situation. Bring your food close and eat in the name of Allah. You should eat this food, but I shouldn't eat it. Then the following day, they went to the Prophet ﷺ and informed him of that. And he said, You have done well by commanding them to eat, and, and you ate yourself. And then this ayah was sent down until he reached the portion and Allah shall not take you to account for the oaths that you made mistakenly. Now for the good things that Allah said they forbade themselves, it meant the delicious foods, which are a blessing for the self and are permitted. Any delicious food that's good for the self, that is permitted. And they were told not to transgress, meaning not to oppress themselves. As mentioned by Ibn Abbas, Mujahid, Qatada, and Ibrahim. And not to come near to what Allah has forbidden. As said by Al-Hasan. And not to travel the ways of other than the Muslims. Like for example, abandoning women. For company as wives. Fasting all the time. And praying the entirety of the night. So do not declare impermissible the halal or otherwise and do not take wealth that does not belong to you and Allah had said that he would not take you to account for what you said in your oaths by accident meaning some of the people that they made haram for themselves women and meat they said messenger of Allah what will happen to our faith which we were given because we made this false oath and this ayah was sent down to them. Now Allah will take them to account for what they said with purposeful intent. So whatever their hearts intended at the time and they had a firm intention without any mistake in their hearts this will be taken to account. But they will have to pay an expiation if they want to break such an oath. We've, also, we've already discussed the word expiation. So someone can look up this word in the details that we gave previously. As far as feeding the poor people, it's narrated from Ibn Omar, Zayd ibn Thabit, Ibn Abbas, Al-Hassan and others that for every poor person, they should be fed one double handful of wheat. This is the position of Malik and Shafi'i. But it's related from Umar, Ali, Aisha and others that for every poor person they should have two double handfuls of wheat. And Umar and Aisha had said that it should be of dates. And this is the position of Abu Hanifa, Rahimullah. The method of our scholars in all of the expiations which involve food. It's just like the expiation that is involved for swearing an oath falsely by Allah, disavowing someone's wife, paying the fidya for things that have happened while in ihram, breaking one's fast when someone is making up fast in Ramadan. They are to give 
one double handful of wheat or barley or one double handful of dates or wheat. Now in order for the condition to be fulfilled for this expiation, you must own the food that you're going to give to the poor people. If you don't own this food or it's stolen, you can't give it as expiation. And this is the statement of Sa'id ibn Jubayr and al-Hakam and al-Shafi'i. Al-Thawri al awzai and others have said it, can be, it will be permitted in certain instances if it became to be owned by yourself later and then you had control over the wealth as said by Abu Hanif and Malik. Now, it is not permissible to take the wealth. It is not permissible to take the wealth that this is going to be used for and to just give it to one poor person. Nor to take out the price of the wealth for the expiation and to just give it in paper wealth. No, this is the statement of Imam Shef and he says this is not permitted. However, Imam Abu Hanifa says it is permitted to use paper to take out the wealth in the form of paper money. As the judge has said that it is permitted in certain instances for the poor people. Whether these poor people are women or men. And it should be the best of what you have that your family eat from. As said by Omar Ali ibn Abbas and Mujahid. And secondly, it should be the best of the food that you can get. As mentioned by Umar al-Aswad, Ubaidah al-Hassan, and Ibn Sirin. And mentioned by Ibn Abbas. So this food should be your best. Not the extra food that you couldn't finish. And the same thing counts in their clothing. Number one, it can be one piece of clothing if you give it. As stated by Ibn Abbas, Mujahid, Tawus, Ata, and Ash-Shafi'i. It can be two pieces of clothing. As said by Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, Ibn al-Musayyib al-Hasan, Ibn Sirin and al-Dahaq. It can be an izar, a cloak and a shirt, a qamis, as said by Ibn Umar. Fourthly, it could be a piece of clothing that covers over, like the malhafa, as said by Ibrahim al-Nakha'i. And it is any piece of clothing that when they wear it, they'd be able to make salah in it. As said by Malik. Now, the madhab of our school is that if someone's giving clothing like this as expiation to a man, it should be clothing that is one thick piece of clothing for him to pray in. But for a lady, it should be two pieces of clothing. A long dress, a long top, and a khimar. And this is according to what is permitted for them to pray in because someone that's poor will obviously be using these clothes to pray in. Or in the case of freeing a slave, this means that it's in general of all people. Now the condition of freeing a slave is that they do so in the right way. And that when they free the slave, it's based upon an oath that they made. And that Allah knows the iman regarding the one doing this. And it's necessary to fulfill all the conditions of freeing the slave. Now, whoever can't do any of these things, then he needs to fast. So when he doesn't find the money to pay or take out, he'll need to fast. Whether it's, whether he, if he, so if he can't find three dirhams or he can't find the wealth to pay the charity, he can't free a slave, he'll have to fast. And this has been mentioned by Qatada. It's been mentioned by Imam Abu Hanifa the same thing. And so the fasting of the three days... Now, the three days are those three days 
concurrent or can they be any three days? Some say that the three days, they have to be concurrent. And this is a statement of Ubay ibn Ka'ab, ibn Mas'ud, ibn Abbas, Mujahid, Tawus, Ata, Qatada, Abu Hanifa. And it is the statement of our scholars. Some say it doesn't, that three days don't have to be concurrent. It's, permissive, it's permitted to have one day on and a break and another day and then a break. And this is the position of Al-Hasan, Malik, and the Shafi'i. And then Allah says that is the expiation when you happen to break your oaths, when you swear and break your oaths, and preserve your oaths. So Allah is telling you to not take your oaths lightly. And to not take them as something minor. Because he makes clear all things. Close quote. So in the case where you have an oath that you've made. And then you violate that oath. The expiation is to feed the ten poor people. Food, the best of food that you have. If you can't do that, then you clothe them with the best of clothing. So for a man it would be a long, something long like a jalabiya. Or a thobe. Or something along these lines because it would be something that he could pray in. That's what it's for because the clothes that you can pray in are also clothes that you can work in. It seems strange to say but there are, only, there are some people who only have a few changes of clothes. And they have, or they'll have two changes of clothes. One which they work in, they go to work in, they go outside in. And one that they pray in. And the one that they pray in will always look so much better than the clothes that they work in or they go out in. Because they know these are the clothes that I wear when I pray to Allah. I wear these ones, but these ones that I go out in, then I can get those dirty, it doesn't matter. So if you give that one an, another piece of clothing, a long piece of clothing, now he's got two pairs of clothing to go out in, and he can still keep the one with the wall. So he has the opportunity to wash them, because what, you, what sometimes happens, and you can see it on Hajj, there'll be the Muslim brother, and you see them that are so poor, what they have to do is they wash the, the clothes of their torso, and you'll see them outside, wringing them out, putting them on the clothes rail, and then they have these on. They're just, they're just their clothes from the waist down, they have them on. Then once they've finished washing the clothes for their torso and they're dry, they put on that piece of clothing, and it's long enough to cover their private parts, so they wash the clothes that they wear from their torso down, and they hang them on. Then once those are dry, then they put them on, and all the clothes are now dry. There are people that have to go through this. And they only have one set of those clothes and then one ihram. So they can't afford to really have their ihram get too dirty. I had two ihrams. They didn't have the luxury of that. Brothers from Nigeria and other places than I, I began to think to myself, well, do I need mine? Am I being tested by Allah in the same way that they are? Of course not. So I gave mine to them. I'm not being tested in the same way. That's their test. If I get dirt on my ihram, I understand some of the fiqhi rulings. I know what to do. Some of them, maybe they don't. So I'll give them my haram because mine's clean and pristine looking. And for some of them, that because the ihram that some of them came in, because another thing you have to remember is some of them are doing qiran. So from the time they left from wherever they're from, they've been wearing that ihram. They've been driving or riding and they've been wearing that ihram. They've been in Qiran that whole time. That's from the time you put on the Ihram to the end of Hajj, you have to wear that Ihram. So isn't it nice if we give them an Ihram so they can change into that one and give the other one a laundering so that way they have an extra set in case they bleed or just to freshen themselves up. You see? So it's looking at clothing them and looking after them. And then if you can't do that, freeing a slave, if you can't do that fasting three days as we said, the scholars differ about whether it's concurrent or not. The Hanbalis say that the fasting has to be concurrent, but the Hanafis say no, it doesn't have to be concurrent. Uh, the Imam says that Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, in one opinion says it doesn't have to be concurrent. So you have one position from Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah says it doesn't have to be concurrent, but the Hanbalis say no, it has to be concurrent. Why? Because the reason why they differ is, at least in one statement from Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, he's saying that it's not Three, because if it was three, Allah would have said mutatabi'at, concurrent. Like when Allah says in Surah Al-Mujadila that someone has to fast a false oath that they made against their wife, Allah uses the word mutatabi'at, 
consistent. So because that word doesn't appear here, we don't do consistently three days back to back. But Imam Ahmed rahimahullah says, no, it has to be mutatabi' because if Allah had wanted to say that it's one by one by one, he, he, it's not thalathati ayyam. He would have said thalatha or thalath. But because he said thalathati ayyam, that means concurrent. You don't always have to say concurrent when something is. So if someone says, oh, I was in hospital for three days, no one assumes that he went in on Sunday, came out for two days, went back in on Thursday, came out for four days, went back in on Friday. No one assumes that. Right? That's the position of Imam Ahmed. He says, when someone says I was in the hospital for three days, that means three concurrent days. So there's a difference of opinion on what that means. Again, I leave that judgment to you. You have to make that decision yourself. But that's the judgment that is there. أقول قبل هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم أستغفر الله إن الله غفور رحيم يرحم الرحمين الحمد لله الله has blessed us we have started a new juice today and we've already gotten through the first page of it so Allah has blessed us we're on the seventh juice now is there a question of, over what we've covered so far yes um, uh, expiation is that part of uh, worship or is that part of uh, transaction When you talk about expiations, expiations are to do with expiations are to do with your and it depends on what area you're looking at. If we talk about fasting, expiations are to do with worship. Some expiation is pure worship. When you talk about fasting and hajj, the kafara or the fidya expiations, they belong to hajj and that. In this case, when we're talking about oaths, oaths are in the book of fiqh under the chapter of transactions. So if someone borrowed in mu'ammalat, it would be permitted for them to do that. Because this particular oath is to do with transactions. But the other oaths that have to do with fasting, your hajj, don't borrow in those because those are pure worship rather than the mu'ammalat, which is the worship that involves other people. Is there another question? Yes. Salam. Can you just give a, a, a brief example uh, for the common people with regard to the uh, difference between Qadha and Qadha? Why don't you explain it but just a bit more to okay. The question is regarding an explanation to the common people regarding what is Qadha and what is Qadr. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam Rasulillah. Qadha is the preordainment of Allah. What I mean by that is all of that which Allah has ordained and will be and shall be is his qada. And that means and is or that's encapsulated in the hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave when he created the pen and he said to the pen, write. And the pen said, what shall I write? And he said, write all that is to be from now until the day of resurrection. This is the qada and the Sahih of Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ further mentioned that all things have been ordained to the point that the rain that is on that comes now was ordained 50,000 years before it fell. That's qada. Qadr. Qadr is destiny. And this more often than not concerns the human being and has to do with what he can and cannot do. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَن شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرُ وَمَن شَاءَ فَمَن شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَن شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ whoever, So whoever wants to believe, let him believe. And whoever wants to reject faith, let him reject faith. Now we see within there two aspects. One that is qada and one qadr. One which is Allah's preordainment, whatever He's willed. One which is the qadr, where you do have a choice in. There is another example of choice 
in which the Prophet وسلم, he said in a hadith in Sahih al Jami'ah that keeping good relations with your relatives and loved ones increases your sustenance. You say to yourself, just a minute. I've read the 40 hadith cover to cover. The Prophet ﷺ, he is sad, a sadiq al masduq, the most truthful, the most truthful ones. He just told, he told us that there are four things that are ordained. And one of them is your sustenance. Yes, that's true. But there's another hadith that says that keeping good relations with your loved ones and your family increases your sustenance. What? Well, this is the fact that there are certain things within the qada that are destiny and are things that can increase and decrease within certain limits. And you say, how do we know? Because we know from what the Prophet ﷺ has told us where these things can increase in, where they can't, where there's sustenance, where, there's, where there can't be. Like sometimes he said once, you remember the statement where he said, the angel Jibreel came to me and asked me if I wanted to come with him or to stay and Allah would, would increase my lifespan. But I decided to go. And he decided to go. That's something where there is some choice in. That's qadr. Now the fact that he has to die, that's qada. But sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given people some additional, some additional lifespan. The Prophet Musa alayhi salam lived to 120. But Allah said when his time came, he sent the angel of death to him and he refused it because he didn't recognize him. And when he came again, he said, You can either I can either take you now or you can live as long as you see the wool on this sheep's back and that's a lot of that's a lot of years because the the sheep each one of the the coils of wool has hundreds of hairs inside of it so if you imagine that the average sheep has a hundred coils of hair hundred coils of hair on each coil well, you know the rest but the prophet musa Islam said i will go now he chose to die he chose to die at that point that shows he has some option within that so some of the things, when, when we start talking about things that we have choice in or things that are changeable within our reality, then those are things that belong to Qadr. The things that there are absolutely no change in belong to Qadr. So when we say the day of resurrection must come, even if all the people prayed together and said, Oh Allah, please don't let it come. It must come. Because he said, Inna yawm al-fasli kana miqata. The day of resurrection is a timed thing. Miqata means calendric. It has a specific time. It can't be stopped. It must come. So that's something that can't be stopped. The Prophet Isa السلام, must come. The, the uh, Imam al-Mahdi, he must come. The Dajjal must come. These are things that are things that cannot be stopped. It cannot be stopped. But there are some things that can be. Like for example when he said when, he, when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said the hadith in Bukhari, he, he said, had I not felt it, that it would be a hardship on my ummah, I would, have, I would have said that every one of you, it's incumbent on you to use the miswak before every single salah. That's a choice, that's an option. Why? Because of the, the importance of cleaning the teeth. He said, had I not thought it a hardship on you, I would have done this. So that shows how important it is. So, some, so Allah rewards some of the slaves of Allah that brush their teeth before every single salah, or they clean their teeth before every single salah because they try to get the reward, keeps the gums clean in between brushings, freshens the mouth, gives you energy in your brain that makes you more alert. So these are examples of things that you have options in. Now the question comes very quickly. The question then comes, but wait a minute. Qada by nature means that there are things that cannot be changed and things that uh, cannot be stopped and, and qadr are things that are choices within that so how do we reconcile them well Allah says himself that he's the one that establishes the book and that he establishes some things and some things he yamhu some things he he erases wipes out now how much of that we know and how we don't how much we don't know Allah only gives us some pieces of that but the fact that Allah tells us the things that we have choices in where we can take steps gives us the ability to know that all right even though everything is set in stone some of the stone is softer than other parts of stone so when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said that the pins have been lifted and the ink is dry or the pages run dry everything's ordained but some ink is drier than other ink so we have some option to move within it 
So when Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu said, Oh Allah, if you have written down my deeds as wretched before, please, oh Allah, forgive me. Wipe it out and write my deeds down as good. Right? And he says, Oh Allah, if you written, wrote me down as a wretched one, please wipe that out and write me down as a fortunate one. These type of things show us that there is some choice, and that choice rep is representing the qadr. As for the qada, thus the preordainment. And the qadr is, it belongs to qada. Because the fact that Allah has preordained you have this possibility, that's part of qada. Yet it's qadr, it's, it's an annex of it. So the most I can say is really that. There's a book, inshallah, that I'm going to translate that covers this question a little bit more. Um, with verses and other statements of the early generations by Imam Mar'i bin Yusuf al-Karmi. And it's about this issue, and it's about 40 pages. So inshallah, I'll translate that, put it up. Can I just ask one quick question? Yes. You know, with bulk, it's obviously a defined time. So you can die as a, a, a martyr in the battlefield, but at the same time, you could die running away. So, Qadr, can that... But not the fact that you will die. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The question is uh, the the fact that you are ordained at your time to die. The fact that you are ordained at your time to die, but how your how you die can change. Is this not an example of uh, qada and qadr's annexation from that? Alhamdulillah. That's correct for the rest of the non prophets. That's correct because the prophets have they're a little they're slightly different because they can choose to live extra and things like that. Human, the rest of the non-prophet human beings, that's absolutely right. So there's a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, where he said that when one of you, death comes and is ordained, his ajal is ordained upon you. And if you move away from one of the sticks of the ajal, another stick of ajal snaps and that one catches you. What the scholars say is what that means is someone that had left or avoided one form of death at his appointed time of death, but is instead killed in another way, that person dies at his appointed time, although the way that he died might be slightly different. Imam Nawi and Ibn Hajar discussed this at, at, some, at some link. So it's possible that someone on the 27th of Rajab, 1439, uh, a car flew in through his window, destroyed all of his furniture, killed everyone else on the couch, and he ducked and it missed him. But that's his appointed time to die. So on the 27th of Rajab, the car flies over his head. He sees the wheel bearings and everything else go over, but he dies of a heart attack of shock. So the truck might have been meant to hit him, but he dies of a heart attack of shock. Okay, so, but he still died on the 27th of Rajab, 1439. Like Allah said, this is what's going to happen to this person. But I have, I've set options within that system. And there's a whole different uh, category of things, and it's deep and very lengthy. Just one final question, Shay, yes. just to elaborate. Is Rafir, he can choose how he takes a life, can't he? So does that affect the cover? The question is, uh, I think Azra'il, you mean? Right. Uh, the question is regarding Azra'il choosing to take how he, uh, he takes a life, whether the, whether this is Qadr or not. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salatu wa salatu Yes, that is correct. That can, that can, be, that can be Qadr or not. Um, and there's again, like I said, there's a lot of questions that come to it, but unfortunately, um, I don't have a lot of the answers because much of the information has not been given to us. Um, we've been given like general maxims. We've been given general maxims. And we've not been given a lot of specific advices other than what Allah has given us of case law. Look at what happened here. Oh, look at that. And that's proof of this general maxim. Okay. So then we take example from that and carry on. Right? Is there a final question? No? Okay. We will stop from here. Yes. Could you tell me um, if we have a translation of the I've never understood if we're actually allowed to read that without or not. Okay. The question is regarding touching a translation of the Quran with, with without wudu or with wudu and whether that's valid or not. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. One of the things that uh, has to be mentioned when we when we discuss the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it Quran Mabin, Quran Majid. Uh, Quran on Arabiya, 
Quran in Arabic, an Arabic Quran. So that means that the Mus'haf that is here, this is the Quran. The translation in English is not the Quran. That is a translation of the Quran. So anything that is other than this Arabic Qur'an is not the Qur'an. It is either a commentary on or translation of the Qur'an. Therefore, in all English translation of the Qur'an, it would be permitted for us to touch it because it is the translation and not the Qur'an. Because it is this that is in the preserved tablet and not the Marmaduke Pickthall or the... Sahih International or whatever else they have. That's what's in the preserved tablet. This is what's in the preserved tablet, not the translation. It is the Arabic Quran that is in the tablet. So if someone touches it with wudu, the translation, English translation, full English translation, with or without wudu, that's not going to affect anything because that's not the Quran. Because as you said that we should try to read it in a language you understand. Yes. And consciously you feel reserved to touch it even though it's in a different language. Yes. And you feel like you're doing the sin or feel guilty about doing that so, yeah. is it, so you, you know you lost time you have time you can do it yes you know in between yes if, if, if someone decides to read the translation of the Quran without wudu that's permitted for them to do but if someone out of taqwa says I want to get the reward and to remember Allah and do wudu as an act of ibadah to prepare myself to remember Allah. So even though I'm reading translation, I want to make sure I remember Allah, then Allah reward them because that's permitted for them to do because that's an act of worship. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept that from them. Sean. What of what about Sheikh when you have um, ayahs of the Quran in Arabic uh, in, in a book? In a book. And also you have uh, tafsirs which are like seven volumes and you have a lot of one volume will have a portion of the Quran in Arabic Hmm. The question is regarding um, when you have translations or commentaries of the Quran that have the entire Quran spread over the translation or portions of the of the Quran that are in translations or other books on various topics. Alhamdulillah. In that particular case, there's a difference of opinion among the scholars. Um, some scholars, like the Hanbalis and others, would say that it is permitted for uh, you to touch it with or without wudu because that's not the Arabic Quran, that's not the Mus'haf, right? Uh, most of the Hanafi scholars, because um, this was asked to Sheikh Muhammad Fawad al-Barazi about this, he was asked about this, and he looked, and he sort of scowled, and he said, uh, he said, taqwa, taqwa should drive you at all points to be careful with the Quran, whether it's intermingled with one book or another. He said, he said, in this particular case, you uphold the strongest position possible out of respect for the speech of Allah. And this is the last time I want to be asked about this matter. <laughs> so we didn't ask him about that, that issue anymore. So alhamdulillah, his, his position, his position as, as, a, as a Hanafi Mufti was that um, because of the fact that even though it's intermingled in a translation, you should still have the taqwa and to make wudu and to hold it with, with, uh, with wudu out of respect for it. Although he doesn't say it's haram to hold it without, but he says out of respect for it, the, the taqwa for it, you should still do so out of out of righteousness and ihtiram of the speech of Allah. Just one final question to you, uh, for the sisters, is that you know, obviously without wudu you can read uh, what about the sisters when it's the, the time? Okay. You know? The question is the monthly cycle and women reading Quran are during the monthly cycle. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Uh, there is a difference of opinion about among scholars on some of the details of that. The most lenient position that I have found is Imam Taqiyuddin al-Futuhi rahimahullah in Mansur al-Buhuti. Uh, their, their, the position of both of these is that if someone if someone is reading portions of the Qur'an as part of a normal dua, like a wird, or it's part of other duas that it's mixed within, that does not count as reading Qur'an because they're not memorizing it or reciting it by itself. But if they were reciting Qur'an alone, or they were memorizing something, then that would be different. 
and it would not be permitted for them to do that. And they go to the statement of Ali where he said, you shouldn't even recite one letter in that case. But any Qur'an that's part of a dua, like for example, if you talk about the four quls, the four quls is more part of a dua, that is a dua that you're making. The intention is not to recite the Qur'an alone, but the dua before you go to bed. Ayatul Kursi before you go to bed. These type of things, the uh, dua before you enter the bathroom, right? That has portions of Qur'an in it. When you leave from the bathroom, it has a portion of Qur'an in it. But that's not why you're reciting it for qira'ah. You're reciting it for the sake of fulfilling the requisite, the prerequisites of that dua. So in that case, you wouldn't have to. But in any other case, you would. Yeah? Okay. So inshallah, we'll stop here. And we'll prepare for maghrib. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika. Mashhadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Innahu ghafur rahim. Assalamu alaikum.